everybody that's here in the sanctuary and those at home that are watching us on live streaming and those that will watch later. I prefer not to be here. I like to wear the other, the headset that I woke up with a cough and I can't get away from the headset and that might be annoying to you. <laughs> During this holiday season, Thanksgiving to New Year's, we often are reminded of our blessings and take the time to say, thank you, God. Thank you, God. Today, I want to share that many of my blessings are based on Unity's teachings. Unity has been tagged, Unity, a way of life. Several years ago, we had a Sunday afternoon gathering to compose a succinct answer when we are asked, what is unity? And we came up with unity is positive, practical spirituality based on the deeper meaning of the teachings of Jesus. In the initial paragraph of Emily Cady's book, Lessons in Truth, she wrote, if there is anything as we proceed you do not understand or agree with, just let it lie passively in your mind. After completed, if you wish to return to your old beliefs and way of living, you are at perfect liberty to do so, but be willing to come as a little child. And what I take from her writing is that you're welcome to accept, accept the things that resonate within you. Just lay the rest aside. What I have found is that which originally might not have resonated within me, later becomes the truth with a capital T as I know it. In unity, we never demand that you believe as we believe or that if you don't believe as we believe that you'll be, uh, we'll lock the doors and you can't come in. You are welcome to join our services, our classes, our seminars, social events, anything you would like to. We see all people as human beings, children of God. I've heard so many times people saying the greatest gift is how unity has changed their lives. If you'd met me in the late 80s, I may have looked similar on the outer, just 35 years younger. <clears throat> but believe me, my insides were empty. I was lost, depressed. Hopeless at 43. It was recommended by friends, not family, that I see a therapist. And I was extremely codependent, tried to please everybody but myself. My therapist and my Mary Kay recruit suggested that I go to Unity. And then, after they suggested, they urged me to go to Unity. I came in kicking and screaming. I didn't feel like I was home the minute I walked in the door. I was Episcopalian before that and I no longer fit in the Episcopal church. I started out on the back row crying and sobbing every single Sunday and we've heard other people say they did too. But I would move forward one row every week. Before I knew it, I was on the second row. If they unlocked the doors, I was there. If they had a service, if they had a ceremony, if they had a class, a seminar, anything, I would be there. And I also became an active volunteer. I enrolled in licensed Unity teacher, Teachers um, Education and I had no idea I'd even ever finished those classes. But lo and behold, I took all of them. And then I passed a three-hour test. I attended my skills demonstration seminar where you give a talk and a meditation. And I graduated and became a licensed Unity teacher. Recently, Dwayne Coppler had a heartfelt message on Facebook that I just loved and I asked him if it'd be okay if I shared it. He wrote, I have been feeling very grateful for my blessings lately. 
grateful for my good health, grateful for my amazing 50-year love affair with Mary, grateful for finding Unity of Springfield 47 years ago, which has changed my life in many ways. There again, how Unity has changed someone's life. Very grateful for my spiritual growth that has totally taken away any fear or physical death and made me look forward to the future. I am very grateful to live in the USA. We have our challenges, but nothing like many other countries in the world. I am so grateful to have connected with Sharon Wyatt at my stage of life. We are so compatible in so many ways. It's almost as if we are identical twins. We like the same foods, books, etc., and often have the same thought at the same time. Amazing. Thank you, God, for my many blessings. And thank you, Dwayne, for allowing us to share this. At this time of thankfulness and gratitude, I want to share with you about the lives of the Fillmores and the history of unity. You'll know when I finish, I'm quite passionate about this. Myrtle was the eighth of nine children. Her father was an Ohio businessman and farmer, and she was born on August the 6th, 1845, and her, she was named Mary Caroline Page, not Myrtle. Her father began to call her Myrtle. Her parents were strict Methodists, Myrtle rejected their puritanical teachings. She loved nature, and that's where she found her spirituality. She contracted tuberculosis at a young age and at, uh, was told all along that she would die young. Age 21, Myrtle enrolled in the literary course for ladies at Oberlin College. And just think, I mean, all those many years ago, I'm sure a female... Uh, Engaging in any further education was probably not the norm. She graduated in 1867, and she taught in Clinton, Missouri. Spent the next 13 years there with the exception of 1877 to 1878, when she spent a year in De Denison, Texas, believing that the climate there would help to improve and recover from TB. Charles Fillmore, Charles Sherlock Fillmore was born on August the 22nd, 1854 in St. Cloud, Minnesota. I'm going to read what Charles said about this experience. When he was about two years old, a band of painted Indians rushed into the cabin and tore Charles from his mother's arms. The Sioux medicine man in full headdress and regalia leaped on his horse with Charles and rode off. Sundown, Indian warriors brought Charles home. Charles was too young to remember what they did with him, but they did bring him home at sunset. Also, when Charles was about two years old, he, his mother gave birth to another son, and this son was named Norton. When Charles was seven, his father moved 10 miles north to a little hut, and Norton ran away from home and never returned to live with them. Now, I'm not sure about a five-year-old running away from home. I don't know how that came about. I wasn't there. Um, <laughs> Charles was about 10 when he fell in a skating accident, injuring his right hip, and it failed to heal it became infected. Um, they tried everything. His mother took him to all kinds of healing uh, modalities. And it just developed so many complications and almost took his life. In Charles's words, he said, I was bled, leached, cupped, lanced, seasoned, blistered, and roweled. Doesn't sound very comfortable. Mother Fillmore helped Charles make um, a set of crutches and he would hop around the cabin. 
Much time was spent in, ba in bed because he was in pain and so weak. At age 12, though, um, the infection waned and the hip socket was totally destroyed and his leg would not grow. It stopped growing at that age. Educated woman nearby with a child about Charles's age tutored the boys and Charles never returned to a regular classroom after that. They studied the transcendentalists. Emerson and Lowell will appear later in this story. As a young man, Charles worked as a printer's helper, a grocery clerk, and in a bank. She moved to Texas, or Charles moved to Texas and worked on the railroad. I think he got fired from that job because he was telling him how to run the business. <laughs> That's what some of the books said. Charles and Myrtle met in Denison, Texas in 1877 or 1878. And this is what Myrtle recalled. When he saw me, he decided he was going to have me for his companion. Of course he hadn't consulted me, but apparently I didn't have much to say about it. But he was awfully nice, and I suppose I was a little hungry to have a home of my own and my very own boys to help me as I'd like to do. Myrtle spent a year in Denison and moved back to um, Clinton, Missouri. She taught there and made $35 a month. They didn't pay teachers well then either. <laughs> Charles lost his job in Texas moved to Gunnison, Colorado, worked at mining and real estate, and Charles asked Myrtle if she would continue their friendship with letters. Charles became established in Gunnison, and he returned to Clinton to marry Myrtle on March 29, 1881. They left that same evening to travel to Colorado two days by train and the rest by stagecoach. I'd have still been stuck in Clinton, Missouri because I wouldn't have done that. Um, they had two sons while they were in Pueblo. On January 4, 1882, Lowell Page Fillmore was born. He was named after James Russell Lowell. And on June 1, 1884, Waldo Rickert Fillmore, named after Ralph Waldo Emerson, was born. In 1884, they moved to Kansas City where Charles was a developer and did work in real estate. But Myrtle's health continued to fail and she was told she didn't even have six months to live. Grandma Fillmore, who was only 11 years older than Myrtle, um, moved in to help them with the boys and Myrtle. In the spring of 1886, and I know you've heard these words before probably, they went to a series of talks given by Dr. E.B. Weeks, and he said, I am a child of God, and therefore I do not inherit sickness. Myrtle heard those words and took them to be her own. She sat in an empty chair, and she knew that the spirit of Jesus occupied the other, that chair, even though it appeared to be empty. <clears throat> she knew Jesus was supporting her and encouraging her in what she was doing. She spoke words of truth to her whole body for two years. And at the end of two years, healing in the late 1880s, Myrtle never consulted a medical doctor. In fact, when she died, she ha they had trouble finding someone to sign the death certificate because nobody had ever seen her as a doctor. Well, word of mouth spread uh, with people constantly coming to Myrtle uh, for healing. And there are many stories of the healing. She told them they were God's beloved children and his will for them was health, that the healing power of the Christ was in them, and they too could have perfect wholeness by realizing this truth. Charles, from 1886 to 1888, he studied metaphysical teachings and all of the religions of the world. 
On July 5th, 1889, a son, Royal, was born. With my calculations, Myrtle would have been 44 and Charles would have been 35. It's just, to me, a miracle that at that age she would have another baby. Christmas, they had no money, and a friend gave them $5 to buy presents for all three boys. In April 1889, Charles published the first issue of Modern Thought, a national monthly magazine devoted to spiritual questions. In April 1890, an issue of Thought, Myrtle announced the opening of a new department called Society of Silent Help. Beginning April 15, 1890 at 10 p.m., words were to be held in silent thought. God is all goodness everywhere and everywhere present. He is the loving Father, and I am his child and have all the attributes of life, love, truth, and intelligence. In him all health, strength, wisdom, and harmony, and has his child, all these become mine by recognition of the truth that God is all. Dr. Weeks' teacher was Emma Curtis Hopkins. In a, Emma Curtis Hopkins um, studied under Mary Baker Eddy and left because they broke away for doctrinal differences. The Fillmores never studied, studied Christian science or under Mrs. Eddy. They went to Chicago to study with her and take correspondence classes, and she even came to Kansas City to teach them. In the spring of 1891, uh, Charles was in meditation as he, he spent hours and hours every day in meditation in the silence. And he cried, Unity! That's the name of our work, the name we've been looking for. In spring of 1891, the Fillmores renamed uh, to Society of Silent Unity. And it was later shortened to Silent Unity. For many years, Myrtle was the only one that answered letters that were mailed to them. And the earliest known letter is dated September the 7th, 1891. Her letters were very sweet, but she didn't cut anyone any slack. She told it like she saw it. If they were whining, she told them they were. <laughs> In 1889, Myrtle started We Wisdom, a monthly magazine for children, and it was discontinued in 1991, to my distress, at 98 years old. Now, why couldn't they have just hold on for two more years so it'd be 100? But it's amazing how many people you talk to that when they were children, somebody... Grandma gave them wee wisdom, or somebody gave them wee wisdom, and they remember it. Uh, Charles Fillmore affirmed always that he was not trying to start a new church or a sect. He was trying to establish an educational institution where people of all faiths could study the laws of life as given by Jesus and learn how to apply them in order to establish a more abundant life for themselves. <clears throat> he considered his philosophy not new thought, but practical Christianity. Meetings were held on Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock so that they wouldn't uh, have any conflict with regular Sunday church hours. The sheriff once came to repossess the printing presses, and they did a lot of their own print. They did all of their own printing, I guess. And Charles told the sheriff he had a rich father, a rich daddy. And so the sheriff laughed, thinking he had a really uh, rich dad that would come forth and give him the money and everything would be okay. Charles meant God. He was ready, Charles was ready to relinquish the idea of teaching and all on a love offering basis. But Myrtle prevailed on him to continue. Charles would 
deliver an address. Myrtle would give a guided meditation and prayer. And when Charles talked too long, Myrtle would reach up and pull on his coattails. <clears throat> in 1942, 11 years after Myrtle's death, there was found um, a covenant written by the Fillmores that was written in, uh, December 7th, 1892. There's a great big picture of it out in our hallway, up on the shelf, I think, above the, the coat. So you can read it in its entirety. In 1903, they incorporated Unity Society of Practical Christianity, a society for scientific and educational purposes. They moved several times around Can downtown Kansas City, and if you drive around there, you'll see a street named Lowell, a street named Myrtle, and other names that meant something to them. In 1905, a man on their board, he was named Mr. Hoagland, mortgaged his own home so that they could buy a lot at 913 Tracy. There remains a Unity Church on that corner. Well, it's not on the corner. It's a little bit down the way. Um, and his daughter uh, later become, became the leader of Silent Unity. The cornerstone was laid on the church, was laid for the church on August 19, 1906. Someone asked Myrtle how unity was supported, and her answer was, through prayer. Myrtle asked one time, are you going to have a meeting about finances? She said, if the answer is yes, I will not be there. The workers at Silent Unity were paid, sorry, compensated on a free will basis with no fixed salary. That'd be a little hard to plan your budget. In 1919, 58 acres of the present Unity Village site were found and the down payment was made March 1st, 1920. 1921, 231 acres were added, including a golf course, a swimming pool, and several buildings. They made 24 attempts when they drill for water or um, gas, they were drilling for water, but they kept hitting oil and natural gas. <laughs> that might have helped pay for them. 1922, Charles gave his first unity lesson over the radio station WOQ the first radio presentation ever made by a clergyman in Kansas City. He couldn't sleep, so he would get up in the middle of the night and broadcast. The Fillmores became vegetarians and opened an inn next to the church on Tracy. The meals were prepared and served on a free will offering. To encourage business, Charles would rent a limo and go pick people up and bring them to the inn to eat and take them back to work as soon as they'd eaten. At a picnic at the village, uh, Charles came upon a worker that was about to take a bite out of a hot dog. And him and Myrtle being a vegetarian, Charles nailed the hot dog to the tree. <laughs> to be consistent, the next year he found someone about to take a bite out of their ham sandwich and he nailed the ham sandwich to the tree. The son Lowell uh, took over administration and their son Rickard. Um, studied at the Kansas City Art Institute, and he was the architect for all of the buildings at Unity Village. Their son, Royal, died in 1923 at the age of 34. He weighed 300 pounds. His wife had died in 1921, shortly after giving birth to their daughter, and he never recovered from the grief of losing his wife. He and his wife or Lowell and his wife took Royal's daughter to raise. Royal was the only one, he worked on We Wisdom, but he was the only one that ever worked with Myrtle. And an issue of Unity Daily Word, which we know as Daily Word, was published 
in July 1924. 1925, Rick built a home for his mother at Unity Village, The Arches. It had no kitchen because Mother Fillmore did all of the cooking. And it was on a dirt road 17 miles out of Kansas City. They would conduct uh, services on Sunday at 913 Tracy, and then they would travel out to the village and stay until Wednesday when they'd go back into town to get the Wednesday evening service. And then they would go back to the villages until they came back uh, to do the Sunday service. In 1929, they built a 165-foot tower and a silent unity building. The tower contained a 100,000-gallon water tank that provided water for the village. It housed, housed a carillon, carillon that chimed music at different times of the day and still does. Silent Unity moved to Unity Village in 1929, but because of the Depression, they had to move back to 9th and Tracy. In 1989, all of these buildings were put on the National Register. In September 12, 2013, they rededicated the refurbished tower. And if you get a chance to go in it, it is beautiful. And it has a 360 degree view from the top of the tower. In March 1931, Mother Fillmore, Charles' mother, died at age 97. She served for 50 years as a housekeeper, babysitter, cook, dishwasher, shopper, counselor, and friend. And she never in all those 50 years accepted the unity teachings. She had been an Episcopalian when they were in Minnesota. In March 29, 1931, Charles and Myrtle celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. And in September, Charles, Rick, and Lowell and their wives all took a trip to the Ozarks. In October 1931, uh, Myrtle Fillmore passed away at the age of 86. The prior Wednesday, she had conducted the healing service, spent Thursday in the office all day, returned to the arches, climbed a ladder to pick apples, Friday, she became ill, and she passed on the following Tuesday at 86 years old. Charles retired from the pulpit in 1933, married his second wife, without my permission, on, <laughs> in 1933. Spent the next 10 years traveling and speaking to groups. In California, he lectured 7,200 people at one sitting, and they turned 1,000 people away. In the preceding 30 years, Charles and Myrtle had only left Kansas City two times. They went to Chicago once, they went to New York City once. So Charles wrote in his 90s, I fairly sizzle with zeal and enthusiasm, and I spring forth with a mighty faith to do the things that ought to be done by me. Charles made his transition in 1948 at 94 years of age. In 2022, The Daily Word has been published for 98 years. In 2022, Silent Unity has existed for 132 years. Prayer, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. So I was taught that Myrtle was actually the one that, that came up with the 12 powers. Not everyone thinks that's right, but I like Myrtle, so I thought she did. <laughs> But Charles wrote about them. And you know all those many books that we have that Charles was supposed to have written, they were actually a series of his lessons that Cora Fillmore put together. So I forgave Cora because of the books. <laughs> Charles' favorite Bible verse was Christ in you, your hope of glory. It's Colossians 1:27. The Fillmores had such humor. At an evening class, Charles said, when this program is over, you all are invited to come over to our place, which was the Arches, for a bite to eat. Myrtle said with a smile, if you do, there'd better be another expression of the miracle of the fishes and loaves. 
One time when they didn't have enough money to pay the staff, the staff was called together to pray about the matter. One of the staff said, let us pray the money holes out. And Myrtle said, no, let us pray our faith holes out. The boys were just children, and Lowell had the mumps, and Rick caught them. Well, Myrtle found them playing barefoot in the rain, and she reprimanded them. And they asked, don't you believe what you say? Charles had taken his laundry um, into the laundromat, not laundromat, but the dry cleaners probably, and it was burglarized, and he came home to tell the family. He was so excited his garment had been under divine protection. His son Lowell said, no, it was just too old to steal. <laughs> May I have a round of applause for the spiritual consciousness that the Fillmores left for us, the hardships they endured, the faith they exemplified and the legacy that they left us. Thank you. And now is the